Well, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today. Pastor Gus Gunawan and Pastor William, thank you so much for your leadership and allowing me to be a part of this service. It truly is an honor and I'm humbled that I get to be here with you. Pastor William and I got to meet a while back when I was visiting. And so I love that I get to continue this relationship and be here with you today. Pastor William said that as a church, you're celebrating the 45th Mission and Outreach Month. And I love that you as a church, you're being intentional about this because we realize the Bible says that this world is in desperate need of a savior. And as a church, we are called to be a light to this world. But sometimes things get in the way, right? At times we get busy and obviously with everything that's happening around the world, work situations have changed and the way, um, uh, you know, we balance work and personal life. And if you have kids, trying to figure out their education and doing all of this, sometimes our priorities change and we forget that our main priority is God. And as a church, God's called us to tell others about how we've experienced his love and his grace. And so as we're focusing on outreach and missions this month, I want to share just some thoughts with you that God's placed on my heart. And I want to start with an interaction that Jesus has with two people. These two people that we see in scripture, they're very different. They're poles apart. And I'm going to read about 10 to 11 verses, uh, but I want to focus in on one verse. The reason I'm reading the whole thing is because I want us to understand the context of what's going on. So I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 7, verse 36 onwards. Jesus was invited to Simeon, who is a Jewish religious leader. He was invited to his house. And so this is kind of what happened. So Luke chapter 7, verse 36 onwards. Afterwards, Simeon, a Jewish religious leader, asked Jesus to his home for dinner. Jesus accepted the invitation. When he went to Simeon's home, he took his place at the table. In the neighborhood, there was an immoral woman of the streets known to all to be a prostitute. When she heard that Jesus was at Simeon's house, she took an exquisite flask made from alabaster, went right into the home of the Jewish religious leader, and in front of all the guests, she knelt at the feet of Jesus. Now, obviously, this is not normal. This was not supposed to be happening. So this is an interesting situation. Verse 38, broken and weeping, she covered his feet with the tears that fell from her face. She kept crying and drying his feet with her long hair. Over and over, she kissed Jesus' feet. Then, as an act of worship, she opened her flask and anointed his feet with her costly perfume. Now, when Simeon sees this, he thought, this man cannot be a true prophet. If Jesus knew, if Jesus was really a prophet, he would know what kind of sinful woman is touching him. Jesus, obviously knowing what's going on, says to Simeon, Simeon, I have a word for you. Go ahead, teacher. I want to hear it, he answered. It's a story about two men who were deeply in debt. One owed the bank $100,000 and the other only owed $10,000. When it was obvious that neither of them would be able to pay, repay their debts, the kind banker graciously wrote off the debts and forgave them all that they owed. Now, Jesus asked Simeon, tell me, Simeon, which one of the two debtors would be more thankful? Which one would love the banker the most? And Simeon obviously answered like we would. I suppose it would be the one with the greater debt forgiven. Jesus said, you're right. And he goes on to tell Simeon, he said, Simeon, this woman kneeling here, she is doing for me what you didn't bother to do. When I entered your home as a guest, you didn't think about offering me water to wash the dust off of my feet. Yet she came into your home and washed my feet with her many tears and then dried my feet with her hair. You didn't even welcome me into your home with the customary kiss of greeting, but from the moment I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't take the time to anoint my head with fragrant oil, but she anointed my head and feet with the finest perfume. Verse 47, she has been forgiven of all her many sins. This is why she has shown me such extravagant love. But those who assume that they have very little to be forgiven will love me very little. 
I don't know if you're familiar with this passage, but there's a, a lot happening here. Jesus is in Simeon's house and all, all of a sudden this lady shows up and, and like you read, there's this comparison of how two people who met Jesus are responding in two very different ways. On the one hand, you have this religious man and on the other hand, you have this sinful woman. And in that context, that in itself were two opposite sides of the spectrum. Because women generally weren't, weren't held of reputable status or they weren't honored in, in that uh, custom or that society. And here Jesus is talking about not just a woman, but an immoral woman, a woman that everyone in that town knew didn't have her life all together. And so here he is comparing two people, a religious guy and a sinful woman. And there's a lot to talk about, but I wanna bring our attention to one verse. I mean, if we were talking about worship and if we were talking about praise, it would be easy to say, okay, let's take these two lives. Um, if you were to compare yourself to these two people uh, from the start of the service, which one would resemble you the most? Uh, would, you, would you be worshiping like the sinful woman or would you be distant like Simeon, the religious leader? Don't worry, we're not talking about that. You don't have to feel uncomfortable. We're talking about just this one verse that I wanna highlight and that verse is the last verse. Jesus said she has been forgiven of all her many sins. This is why she has shown me such extravagant love. But those who assume that they have very little to be forgiven will love me very little. To who, a person that believes that they've been forgiven a lot will love Jesus more. A person that feels like, oh, there's not a whole lot that I've done, so I don't have to be forgiven that much, they, Jesus is saying, will love him less. I want to tell you the story. I grew up in a Christian home, and we had a guest speaker come to our church. And while he was sharing his testimony, I mean, this guy lived a crazy life. He grew up um, not as a Christian and the part of the world that he lived in, um, he spent a lot of his younger days attacking Christians. And he, t I mean, this was like a crazy story. Uh, he lived in this village and so he would tie a sword to the front of his motorcycle and he would drive through crowds where there were Christians just so that he could hurt them. I'm sitting here, as, and so then he shares a story of how Jesus saved him and he radically changed his life and now God's using him in a powerful way. Here I am as this little kid listening to the story and going, that is an incredible testimony. Man, I probably need to go sin some a little bit so that I can get a testimony like that. And then I can tell people, oh my goodness, look how much Jesus transformed and changed my life. The only reason I thought of that was because I didn't fully understand what God had done for me. It's not about how much sin you've done or how much sin you haven't done. The reality is, and the Bible says it very clearly, that all have sinned. All have sinned. And so when we understand the depth of where Christ has saved us from, our only response can be one just like this woman where we bear our soul to him. It's when we feel like, man, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I've been doing good all my life. I don't really need God because he was a religious leader. You got to understand he understood what it meant to invite a guest to his home and what the protocol was to honor that guest. But he didn't even do the bare minimum when it came to Jesus. So you have to wonder what was going on in his mind. Did he feel like he probably had it all together? Here are two people that Jesus is telling us about, a religious man and a sinful woman. And Jesus, while he's the same, the way they interacted with him was different. Now, is it just because of a religious leader and a sinful woman? No, no, no. The Bible tells us of another religious leader who thought he had it all together until he had an interaction with Jesus that changed everything. It was Apostle Paul. 
The Apostle Paul was the one that said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul understood that while he was religious, while he was doing everything that he knew, he realized that his actions didn't make him holy. It was Jesus Christ who forgave him of his sins, and it was Jesus Christ who had all the glory. It was because of what Jesus did that Paul could enter into the presence of God. Paul understood where he was and the sinner he was. When we think about outreach, when we think about missions, why am I talking about the story of the religious man and the sinful woman or Paul? I, I bring it up because for us to be an effective share of the gospel, for us to be an effective influence in the communities we live in, it starts with a deep understanding of our relationship with Christ. Because I know life happens, things get busy, and if you uh, have, have uh, known Christ and if you gave your life to Christ years ago, I wonder sometimes over the years as time passes by, we forget how much he saved us from. Or maybe you grew up um, and, and you didn't have this radical transformation story. You've been living a good life and doing everything you can and you've been following Christ and maybe you've forgotten the depth of where Christ saved you from. I believe that for us to be an effective church, for us to reach the lost, it starts with us understanding how lost we were. I love what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. He says, For you see, even though I proclaim the good news, I can't take credit for my labors. For I'm compelled to fulfill my duty by completing this work. He's talking about I'm compelled to share the gospel. He continues to say, It would be agony to me if I did not constantly preach the gospel. What would cause someone to feel a deep sense of agony if they cannot share what God did in their life. I, I, I think back to, um, it was almost 21 years ago when God changed my life. And yes, while I did grow up in church, I ended up falling away from God and I started doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. And I remember getting to such a desperate place in my life where I, I, didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to live anymore. And I don't know if you've ever felt that, felt that kind of desperation where you were willing to end everything. I remember sitting with a friend of mine and he asked me this one question that changed everything for me. He said, Alan, why don't you give Jesus a chance? And I was so tired of life. I was so tired of trying to do things my way. Everything that I did, uh, just amounted to failure. Nothing seemed to work. Uh, from the outside, you might think that I had it all together. I had a ton of friends, I, I looked happy. But when I came home and when I was faced with reality, I found this, I found my heart filled with this deep sense of unhappiness and, and I didn't know what I could do to fill that void. And when he asked me the question, why don't you give Jesus a chance? I said, sure. That night, everything changed for me. And so when I think about what God saved me from, I'm reminded of my friends. And, and here I have the answer. Here I have the solution to what they're searching. Why would I not share that with them? Now, this might not make sense to everybody, but there are some of you that know what I'm talking about. When you think about what Christ saved you from, you think about the marriage that you have right now, you know that wouldn't be possible if it weren't for God. When you think about the, the, the life that you're living, the career that you have, the, the, the job that you have, the, the friends that you have, when you think about the fact that you wake up in the morning, you're excited to face the day, you know that that's happening because of what Jesus did in your life. So why would we not share this with the people that we know? You understand what the sinful woman and the Apostle Paul have in common. Two very different people, but they knew how much saving they needed. And when they saw Jesus, when that woman saw Jesus, the only response she could have was what we read earlier. 
Now here's the dilemma. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, again, the Apostle Paul says this, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells him? Paul is talking about how the only way that people can be saved by Jesus is if somebody tells them about him. Now, I want to show you this chart. Um, a mentor of mine showed this to me years ago. And this chart that you're looking at is the population of the world that has grown over time. So if you see, it starts from zero going all the way to where we are today. And if you notice, there's a steep climb in the population. There's more people alive today than ever before. But what's interesting is that while there are more people alive today than ever before, we are more connected today than ever before. Because we've got technology, we've got the internet, we've got cell phones and laptops and iPads, and we've got all these opportunities for us to connect with people that live all over the world. In fact, take this moment right now. We are a church that is located in multiple locations and I'm standing here in the U.S. preaching this message, but yet we get to experience this together because of technology. And so I believe that you are alive right now because God knew that he, he wanted someone like you to leverage every opportunity, every platform, every tool that we have so that others would know what Jesus did in our lives. I remember taking this trip uh, to India. I'm originally from India. I'm from the southern part of India, but I took a trip to the northern part of India. The culture was different, the language is different, everything's different there. And I was preaching at this church and I had a translator. And at the end of the message, I asked people if they want a prayer, come forward. And this, uh, among the people that came forward, there was this one family that came forward, uh, a, a man, his wife, and this little child, and he was crying as he was standing in front of me. And through the translator, I started asking, what's going on? What does he need prayer for? Well, it turns out that this guy was an alcoholic. And no matter how much he tried, he couldn't kick that habit. He was just, he was just caught in that addiction. And he would drink and he would come home and with him not being in his senses, he would then begin to physically abuse his wife. And then the next day morning, he would wake up and he'd feel so guilty for what he did that he would begin to hurt himself. And he, and he started lifting the, the sleeves of his shirt and I could see marks on his hand where he had taken something sharp and began to hurt himself because he felt so guilty for what he did to his family and he was standing there saying, can you pray for me? Now obviously, I didn't understand what he was saying. It was a translator, it was kind of confusing and then when I finally got the story, I would pray and then the, uh, the translator would translate and it just, it took a long time and either way, after that event, I remember flying back home to the, to the US and it was a long flight and I remember thinking, God, I wish there was a way. Because the Great Commission, Jesus said, I want you to go into the world and preach the gospel. But going into the world is not easy. It takes time, it takes money. You have to get on planes and you have to understand cultures. And if you don't understand the language, you need a translator and it's not the most efficient way. And I remember just being frustrated and thinking, God, if there was a way that we could overcome language barriers, overcome time zone barriers, overcome distance barriers so that we can take this truth because people need to hear the gospel. I wish there was a way to do this. Fast forward, I think it was almost three or four years later, I got the opportunity to be part of an amazing move of God where we leverage technology to reach people from every country on earth. You have that same opportunity. You can make a difference in lives all over the world. And so what I wanna to do today is as we understand, because I talked about how what, what we do comes from a depth of understanding what God saved us from. And when we get that, we too should be like Paul where we feel a sense of agony if we don't share this gospel. So what are some practical ways 
that we could do this. And if you're wondering, you're like, uh, Alan, I'm, I'm not super technical or I, I would love to do it. I don't know where to start. I want to give you three simple things that you could do to start making a difference. All right. Three simple things. The first is this. You can start by inviting someone to church. I love the fact that we're online. You know, it's sometimes if you want to invite someone to your church and maybe they don't live near you, now because of the fact that we are leveraging technology, no matter where someone lives, you can invite them to church with you. Now, I, I understand some of you might be nervous. You might not feel confident to share the gospel. And so you might be wondering, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what to do. Bring them to church with you. Bring them to church with you because when they come to church, you know, especially here, you know that they're going to hear a powerful message, that they're going to meet a loving community, and they will experience the love of God, which can radically transform their lives. Missions and outreach can be a simple step of just inviting someone to your church. That one invite could change someone's life forever. I know it changed mine. When my friend said, hey, can you give Jesus a chance? It was one invitation that changed my life. And so what, what's something that you could do? A simple step could be for you to invite someone to church. The second thing that you can try is uh, start a Bible study with your friends. And again, um, I uh, met this group. Um, uh, I served as a church online pastor at Life Church for many years. And I met this group where none of them lived in the same country. It was an online Bible study where there were people from the U.S. and Japan and the Middle East and Asia and just all over the place. And this Bible study has been going on for years. And one day they decided, hey, what would it look like if we could all come together? And so they all showed up in the city that I lived and they attended one of the services at the church that I was a part of. And when I saw them, you, if you looked at them, if you saw them meeting each other, you would have thought that they were friends for years and they were hanging out together all the time. At that point, they had never seen each other face to face. This was the first time that they were meeting together in person, but you could see how connected they were because they made an intentional effort to be there for each other online. And they would just do these Bible studies. I think they did it on Zoom. But it was incredible to see the relationship that was built over the years when you saw a few people simply take an intentional step to study the Word of God together. For some of you, it might be on a video call. Some of you might start a Facebook group. Um, I love the YouVersion Bible app because you can do a Bible study with friends. What would it look like for you to invite your coworkers, your friends, your family members that may not know Christ, invite them to do a Bible study with you? That's a simple, practical step, and you can do it with people anywhere in the world. So, the first, you can invite someone to church. Second, you can start a Bible study, um, leveraging technology. And the third one is you can leverage your own social media influence. Um, I learned this years ago uh, when, I, when I had, uh, you know, with my social media, I was like most people. I'd share, you know, random stuff that was going on in my life, going on at home, going on at work. And if I saw a cool car or something like that, you know, I just or here's what I had for lunch today or whatever it was. I just randomly just shared some stuff. And I realized I felt like God was telling me, hey, because um, I would often share a devotional or I would invite people to church. And God said, why don't you use the influence I've given you online? And so I thought, well, how do I do that? So what I do is I would, as I do my personal time with God on a daily basis, I would just take a verse that stood out to me and I would post it and I'd write a quick thought around it and I'd just share it. And I started doing that every day. What's interesting was, and you can follow me if you go to my Instagram account, for example, I'll put a link on the screen. If you go to my account, you'll see it for years now, I'd post a verse or a thought or a quote that stuck out to me, and I started seeing people share that with their friends. They would, in the comments, say, oh my goodness, Alan, this was exactly what I needed to hear. And many of these people were people I've never met before. But you see, when you allow yourself to be used by God and you walk in obedience, you never know how God could use your step of obedience to reach people all over the world. 
It's so simple. The tools, the platforms, everything's available for us. Can you imagine as you start doing that, what would happen to the people that know you? Imagine if we start doing that as a church. Can you imagine what this would look like? You'd have people from all over the world joining you in your services. You see communities rising up together, doing Bible studies together, learning, growing, being there for each other. Because the, the church is not a building. We are the church and we're called to reach this world. Can you imagine all of you on your social media uh, uh, accounts and obviously, you know, talk about what you're excited about. But if God is what you're also excited about, that needs to be present where you are. Can you imagine the impact we as a church could have? You never know who you might be reaching. I can tell you story after story where people have direct messaged me and said, this one quote made, a, made me think and, and I've been running away from God. Can you tell me what it's like to, how do, I, how do I give my life to Christ? And I've, through Instagram direct messages, shared the gospel and led them to Christ. It's possible if you are willing to step out and obey him. Remember the friend I told you who shared the gospel with me, asked me the question, why don't you give, it, give Jesus a chance? Here's something I didn't share with you. He was led to Christ by my dad. So my father led him to Christ. And my father passed away before he ever knew that um, I gave my life to Christ. So until uh, it was December of 1999 that he died in a car accident. And so... He was believing that his son would change his life, but he never saw that happen. But the one person, one of the people that he did lead to Christ, lead to Christ that it was that person that led me to Christ. You never know the seed that you sow, the kind of harvest that you will reap in the future. Ephesians 3.20 says this, God is willing to do immeasurably more than we can dare to imagine. If you believe that, why is he not doing it? Why is he not doing immeasurably more? I'll tell you why. Because he's waiting on you. And so my prayer for you, this year, this month, this outreach and mission month, I pray would be a turning point in your life. For those of you who are already doing this, I pray that you step into a next level. Uh, your intensity just go goes to the next level and you begin to be intentional and, and you have eyes to see the people that God's leading you to. Because when we come together as a church, I believe that we will see incredible things. So I'm excited. And I'm hopeful for all that God's going to do in and through you. I'd love to say a quick word of prayer and then close. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come together. I pray that for those who are hearing um, my voice right now, I pray that you would speak to their hearts. Give them the confidence and the boldness to do what you've called them to do. I pray that this church would be a church that reaches people all over the world, that they would see story after story where lives have been completely transformed because of their obedience. God, we believe that you can do immeasurably more than we can dare to imagine. And I thank you that in the following days, weeks, months, we're gonna see the result of the seeds that have been sown. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.